Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're all here uh, this evening to pay tribute to and celebrate Antonio Cassese. And I'd like to extend a very special welcome to Silvia Cassese here. Silvia, our thoughts have been with you for the last few months, and welcome. Now, many of you will have been present for or read the multiple tributes to Antonio Cassese as a judge, as a scholar, as a human rights monitor, as the founder of international criminal law, and so on and so on. If you look outside, there's an exhibition in the Uni Maya, you can see the multiple facets of Antonio Cassese. I will not be amalgamating all of those tributes or trying to summarize them. It seems appropriate to me tonight that I should try to focus on another dimension of Nino, as I will call him from now on. And that is um, Nino as mentor and teacher. Uh, many of us were very privileged to have been schooled by Nino in those roles. And we feel, I suppose, a sense of responsibility to carry on and implement some of the lessons he handed down to us. Now, of course, we've had to be selective. Not all of his traits can be taken on hook, line, and sinker. Some of us draw the line at working right through Christmas Day. Others have not found it humanly possible to produce a book a year or to become successively the president of three international institutions. Paul Memoir, Antonio Cassese was the president of the Council of Europe's Committee for the Prevention of Torture, the UN's International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Nor do we have the stamina to found three very successful institutions, the Academy of European Law, the European Journal of International Law, and the Journal of International Criminal Justice. And in fact, I don't know of anybody who has an honorary doctorate from both the University of Geneva, where we are now, and the Graduate Institute of International Studies. Um, no, I wanted to recall some of the lessons I have absorbed, and perhaps until recently I hadn't really reflected on. And it's only be by meeting others who had Nino as a mentor that I've begun to form some thoughts about what it means to have him as a role model in the teaching world. So, lesson number one, law is there for a purpose. This was not so much a mantra for Nino, but a way of being. From the moment he woke up, he had plans for developing and interpreting the law in order to reach a desired result, which could be simplified as a world with less suffering, greater fairness, and a strengthened international oversight of all those who sought to undermine those community values. Each project had a wider and more ambitious goal. The European Committee Against Torture would become a UN worldwide committee. A tribunal for the former Yugoslavia would spawn a new legal order for war crimes in internal armed conflict and eventually an international criminal legal order. And a special tribunal for Lebanon would become or become the beginnings of a world court to try acts of terrorism. Now, this last idea of Nino's is revealed in the concluding chapter of his last book, Realizing Utopia. And many of you here tonight have actually contributed to that book. And if you go back to your invitation asking you to contribute to his book, as I did this week, you will see we were actually invited to imagine a realistic utopia. By the time Nino had finished editing our chapters, some titles had changed, including the title of the book, now called Realizing Utopia. It was clear that while we might be imagining a realistic utopia, Nino was busy realizing it. Lesson number two, be not afraid of authority. Nino was often fearless in confronting prison guards in Turkey, Janjaweed in Darfur, permanent representatives to the UN here in Geneva or in New York. He was convinced that his job was to confront these people and the sovereign states with their misdeeds. And if they could somehow be shamed into changing their ways. Now, it did not always work out as planned. He famously lost his seat on the UN Subcommission for Human Rights for standing up to authority over the disappearances in Argentina. And when confronted with apparent authority in law, he sought to confront that as well. When confronted with the authority that war crimes did not exist as a concept in internal armed conflict, but could only apply to conflicts between states, he said and thought and spoke to his colleagues on the bench, and I quote, why don't we just jettison this stupid distinction between international and internal armed conflict? And he set up a team to look for enough evidence to make the case 
and in that same interview, Nino admitted but that perhaps there was not, not a lot of evidence, but there was some, and you know the rest. Lesson number three, teach students to work very hard, but be ready to set them free. This is a hard one for me to articulate to you, but I'll try and explain how I came to it. After one year in Florence, I received a letter from the Law Department. The other members of the Law Department considered that my work, what the so-called June paper, was satisfactory. But the new professor in town, a certain Antonio Cassesi, was blocking my passage into the second year. He said I, the colleagues in the Law Department said I should try to see him immediately. Nino invited me to lunch on Sunday with Sylvia and the children and pointed out that all the points I had raised in my paper were wrong. <laughs> but if I read all the books that he was recommending and rewrote the whole chapter over my summer holidays, there was a chance he might let me continue in Florence. <laughs> and from that day on, the bar kept moving up and up every year. Now, I'm not quite sure how he achieved this, but all of us who studied under him and were mentored by him were given the impression that we could be working harder, we could be reading more difficult texts, we could be mastering more languages or writing more case notes. But the most generous lesson I take away from this and from this aspect of Nino is that those of us who were schooled by him were fairly quickly expected to make it on our own. We were cut loose and expected to think for ourselves with little or no interference. Now, there is a real challenge here for any teacher, and there are many in the room. How do you instill industrious scholarship in your pupils through loyalty, but at the same time ensure independence and autonomous thought? The last lesson, at least for now. All of this is not much worth very much if we cannot make a difference. Nino did not really suggest this to me or anyone else. I think he just did it. I remember bumping into Joseph Weiler at the American Society of International Law in 1995, and I asked him how he was, and he said, bored, depressed. But he went on to say rather wistfully, you know, Andrew, of all the people in our world, Nino is the one who's making a difference. He's really doing something. Now, of course, at this point, Nino would have said, no, 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 I, I'm just writing down ideas and standing on the shoulders of scholars. But we all know that it is no exaggeration to say that Nina Cassesi made the world a better place and inspired many of us to look for a purpose, not only in law, but purposes in our lives. And with that, I will stop and pass the floor to my colleague and friend, Paola Gator.